Welcome to the Win All Day Every Day podcast presented by Prairie Hockey Academy. My name is Barrett Kropp and I'm joined by my co-host Justin Simpkins. Barrett, great to be here again today. Yeah, I'm really excited about today's episode. We are being yeah. joined by Jeff Sandquist, uh, born and raised small town Saskatchewan uh, dude uh, that has used his experiences over the last number of years to work himself from being a, a really hard, humble working Saskatchewan guy all the way up the corporate ladder to the point where he was the vice president of Twitter, of Microsoft, and now at Automatic. Uh, we're going to hear some incredible stories of how he was like the 1% of corporate leaders in the world. And the, the most important thing that he tells us today is how leadership is not just by accident. It is by diligent, like developing characters, developing culture and community. And uh, I think it ties perfectly into our sports analogies that we you know, we want to continue to be the, the podcast that helps high performance families navigate through sports. And it's no different in the corporate world. And that's what Jeff's going to talk about today and how to develop leaders in, in, in a fashion that is all about humble, hardworking excellence. What do I look for in talent? Yeah. Right. Or what is that talent going to be? You know, it's a lot of those things of, of like of just being a good human, being in a small town. It's hard to dream. People, friends may tease you. Who are you to say that you can make the NHL? Who are you to tell me that I'm not going to? So, Jeff, do Fortune 500 companies actually need great leadership and, and established cultures? Oh, I mean, you were working in a large company. It, 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 it is all about leaders. You know, leaders do three things. So they create clarity, they generate energy, and they deliver success. You know, it's like that's leadership in a nutshell. And either that the top of the company you need leaders, and I always would say in my teams, everybody's a leader in one moment, whether they have people working for them or not. Um, you know, their the most junior employee can be in a moment where they have to be a leader. So yeah, from top to bottom. Yeah. And over your time, like back when you were with Microsoft, um, I think I read that they described you as a Microsoft evangelist. And so you know, as a VP of, you know, team development and different things, what, what would you do or how did you go about developing that culture within your, your corporation? Culture, like, you know, there's a saying, it's like culture eats strategy for breakfast. You can have the best laid plans, but if you don't have the right environment, the right people, the right leadership, you'll fail. And so for me, um, the journey that I was at Microsoft, one of, the, one of the greatest runs that I've had in the industry was really around product name Azure. And people really looked at Microsoft a very certain way that we were a company that built Windows. We built Windows and we built Windows. <laughs> and we were in a distant, distant second place in the cloud. Amazon was number one. We were late to the market and the company had to transform. People actually don't realize how bad things were at Microsoft in that time. Like mm -hmm. it just, it was not great. I left. I went to go work at Twitter for a couple of years. I was like, I'm out of here. Yeah. Um, and uh, I went back and it really became about new ideas, culture, and a thing called growth mindset. Mm. And really Satya really leaned in and the company became CEO, taking over Steve Ballmer, which was around that growth mindset. Hey, do the best ideas come from here? Do the best ideas come from the loudest person in the room? No. The best ideas come from being able to have a growth mindset, be a learn-it-all rather than a know-it-all. Mm -hmm. Our culture was at Microsoft was pretty toxic prior to Satya. And so, you know, there were certain things that he brought focus to the company, but around products, but it was really around culture first. And how do you create an inclusive um, an environment that's productive, that we had, we listen to people in different ways. Um, that's everything, hmm. e everything in software, everything in, in that I'd go do that people go, Oh, it must be so technical. Every engineering, every technical problem is a people cultural problem. Hey, people don't want to work together. People aren't hearing each other. Hey, they don't have clarity and direction. They're, they're, they're all, Leadership, people, culture, and you can see people. You can. Hey, how do you? So you know, you answer your question. You know, how do you do that culture? Well, well, you model it, right? You, hey, this is the culture we want. Right. Hey, this is how I want you to be when I'm not in the room. <laughs> hey, this is how I am when you're not in the room. I'm that same person. You coach, right? Hey, was that a great meeting? 
ah, it wasn't maybe my best either. Hey, how can we do that better? Coaching, right? Yeah. How do you help people be better? And then the third one, you care, right? Mm-hmm. Their well-being, right? It's a different world now, right? Some of us work from home now. Just lots of things changed, you know, especially during the pandemic and post-pandemic. But, you know, in employees' well-being, it's around, around caring as well, too. So it's like model, coach, care, bringing that into it. And then it was like bringing new examples. Hey, this is the right behavior, right? Hey, you hire somebody and you you you, you help them show the culture of the company and you don't say, you're new here, you don't understand anything. We'll talk to you in six months when you learn. You go, let me learn every single thing about you. How do you see our products? How do you see our team? What seems broken from you? What did you do in your previous company? Oh, what did you learn in college? What are the new things? What are your friends saying? As opposed to, hey, oh, they're the new guy. Yeah, they're just going to, well, we'll see if they make it. Or the new gal. Right? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, those were a few things there. But it's around model coach and caring. It's about, you know, bringing that clarity to team so that, um, you know, people can do the things that they didn't realize that they could go to. Yeah. So I kind of, I want to dig into that a little bit. I think Jeff, like that's uh, really profound. I think there, there's two things right at the start. You said, you know, leaders bring clarity. I thought was, was really good. Uh, you know, we talk lots about leaders take responsibility and, and you said the same thing there. And it sounds like Sacha would came in as the CEO and really changed the culture. I, I would, I would be one of the people that on this side that would say, I didn't realize that what you just told me, we didn't realize how bad things were at Microsoft for a while. Um, Obviously upon recruiting you back, there must've been some clarity given to you. What was there something there that you were just like this growth mindset or how did they approach you again to go, you know, come back here and, and you, it was was a funny story. Um, that's good. We love funny stories in the win all day yeah. the podcast. It's perfect. I was at Twitter <laughs> yeah. and I'd been there. I was coming up around 18 months and I could see certain financial things with the company and I was just feeling off. And honestly, what we were doing as a family was kind of nutty when I went to Twitter. I wanted to hit reset. I want to hit refresh. My wife's like, you're entrepreneurial. She says like, you know, everyone always says uh, Microsoft sucks. This they suck as a company. Silicon Valley's where it's at. You should go take a run there. Can you go make it? And I had a call and an offer to go work at Twitter prior to it going public. And like Twitter was like six, seven hundred employees. Very like I was talking to Dick Costello, who was the CEO of the company, about coming on there to do developer stuff. And I had a we were like crazy how we did it. it was like we moved me. <laughs> you know, I looked at it kind of like, like my family was like here in Seattle and I moved down there and had a small apartment, literally downtown San Francisco, right across from Twitter. And I sort of treated it like everybody in Twitter thought that I lived there and maybe my family was there. So I didn't want to show like I, we decided that I was going to go down there and do this run. And, um, it was wild. And it was a really incredible time. I got to see the company go public. We went from 750 to 4,000 employees in the company. Um, just this incredible experience. Uh, you know, it was in this peak time of San Francisco called business to consumer apps, where it was like everybody was building apps for the iPhone. You'd turn on CNBC the, in the morning and you'd be like, Twitter was there. I'd walk into the office in the morning and there's like Dick in being interviewed viewed on TV, you know, for CNBC. And I had this, this crazy run, but I knew there was a certain size and scope of the problem set there. And I knew certain things financially, like I was only going to grow a certain type of way. And you get better, by the way, in telling these stories afterwards. They're never that <laughs> this clean, right? But um I reached out to a friend at Microsoft and I said, how are things back there? And he goes, oh, it's getting better. But boy, we've cut people. We've we cut head count. We've done layoffs. We're restructuring. And it's not the same place. And I said, well, that's good. <laughs> that's a good sign. And he was like, you interested in coming back? And I said, yeah, I am. And I was well-loved um, and very luck- lucky to do so. There was like, Sacha knew who I was. He was a bit of a mentor. He was someone who people that were very close in his directs had affection for me as in a young, early in my career of the work that I went to get done. When I left Microsoft, 
to go to Twitter, there was a bit of a wound uh, for me. Kind of, I was like, told my boss, I'm going to leave. And, you know, we just, he's like, okay, it was, it was a weird time in the company. And many people were like, if we knew you were going, we, we, we just didn't want you to leave. And so the, when I went to, to come back, I kind of reached out, talked to somebody and Sachin and them found out and they sent one of those super senior leader down to San Francisco to have dinner with me. And we just chatted about old times and the company and what I was up and uh, doing at Twitter. And they're like, wow, we never imagined you would do the damage to our mobile business showing up at a little social media startup. <laughs> and I, my background of what I specialize in doing things for software developers and how do you get them to build innovative work. And, and I said, look, I'm ready to come back home. And they said, look, why don't you don't worry about picking a job? We'll just, we just want you back. And you can pick your job when you got here. And I'm like, wow, okay. And it was this crazy process where over a number of few weeks, they kind of had identified three roles for me. And um, I basically signed up not knowing what I was going to go back to go do. <laughs> um, more on that in a little bit, but just kind of a bit of the bridge is I was offered three roles. First two were pretty like sexy, really cool. And the third one, was just meat and potatoes and just fixing something that just needed to be fixed. Hmm. I took the third after much consternation and I would not have the life or have had the success if I had not gone to do this job that they had me go do. And even to the point, like I didn't take the most sexy one. I came back. There was like very visible ones. Even my friends in the company went, you took what job? <laughs> <I> said, <"This, laughs> you come join me, right? What else did they offer you? I said, this or this. Why didn't you take that? And I was like, this one here actually matters. It needs to be fixed. We're going to turn this Yugo mm -hmm. into a Porsche. I promise you, my friend. And <laughs> we did over a number of years. But yeah. Um, you know, but yeah, that was my return back to Microsoft. Just blessed. Um, I was in San Francisco. By, we, I'd spent a year down there by myself. And then uh, my wife was like, I miss you. This is just crazy. And um, it's about, about the last year, whatever is there. My wife and our daughter moved down. We lived in downtown San Francisco proper. Josie went from suburbia school in <laughs> outside, suburb of Seattle to inner city. It was a private school because you have to do that there. But riding the subway to school each day, um, the friends and, and people that I've met in that time, my coworkers, the people that I threw that Twitter wave, I still talk to yeah. probably two or three times a week. The people through that time mm -hmm. Twitter, we took a company public. Um, we built just the visibility and the time that we had. Those leaders as Twitter long before Elon, those leaders are all across the entire industry. Hmm. Really remarkable. But yeah, my Microsoft time, I took the worst job that there could be. And everyone's like, you took what? <laughs> And I was like, this is great. Nobody <laughs> cares about this, but it just needs to be fixed. Let's just get this done already. And um, yeah. that really stood out to people. I love the process, though, that they, you know, with the senior leader that came down. We've talked about, uh, or I've talked about in the past, anyway, you know, the book Good to Great by Jim Collins. And one of his Good to Great principles is that first who, then what, right? So getting getting the right people on the bus and then at that point in time, finding the right seat for them once they're there. And uh, not mm -hmm. telling them everything they need to do, saying, here's some big challenges we have. You're the right yeah. person. We trust you and the other couple of right people we put on this bus to figure out how to get through this boulder, right? And, and then that, that just empowers them. Uh, and it sounds like that's been, you know, what's, what's been happening there in a, in a really cool culture by the, by the sounds of things. Yeah, and it's like, you know, actually, you may have to bleep a little bit of this out, but I'll tell you a story. Um, it was early. I wish it wasn't in the room, but it's it's in a few books. It's about Sacha. And he brought like the most senior leaders in the company together. And there's a certain level of employee in the company that like, is like your corporate VP. There's only about 120 of those in a company of 150,000 employees. So I was one of those corporate VPs. And, uh, and Sacha like, runs a cadence. Like he brings his extended VPs together and, and how that operates. It's just, just phenomenal leadership. And uh, so anyway, he had brought together in a room, all the new, all the, all the corporate VPs and stuff as he's taking over the company. And somebody asked just this 
you know, you get everybody in a room and somebody's going to either not ask a question or make a statement or just you're going, why are they asking this now? <laughs> right. Right. And so somebody said, hey, we're going to make it so that we can. When are they going to fix it to get that so that we can print from our iPhones to the printers here? I mean, literally, like you have like, I don't know how many trillion, billion dollars in market cap of a company and a leader here. You've got all of their leaders <laughs> and you're going to complain about printing. <laughs> and so I just like, fix it. Fix it, man. Like, fix it. He said, you are one of the most senior leaders at Microsoft. You're frankly one of the most senior leaders in the entire industry. Actually, in the world of business, if you go from architect, you're one of the most senior leaders in the world. And you're complaining about a printer. Your job as a senior leader in our company is to take glasses full of shit. And you reach into those glasses full of shit and you're going to find little rose petals that are embedded into them. And your job as a leader to pull out that rose petal out of that shit with your bare hands. So we can go do work. Next, <laughs> you know, like, and it was that it is in that book. And it was like, literally, you got to reach in there and you got to pull out those rose petals of shit. Right. And like, you know, that's when you're at your best as a leader. That's when you're at your best. It's like when things just suck. Yeah. We just got beaten. There's sports analogies here. Hey, marketplace is kicking our butts. Our peers and every other people don't believe in us. I'm here with you, man. Hmm. I, I remember like just having a lousy, lousy day one time, you know, early in my career, like one employee went to a competitor. Really, we didn't have to lose them. If we'd just gotten together, we probably could have kept them on, on our team. It was 1030 in the morning, something else went wrong. And some project of mine was just a disaster. I just sent a note to my boss and I think I just said, I don't know what to do. He was there in 10 minutes, honestly. He's like, you want to do a shot? <laughs> He's like, we can do a shot. And this is in corporate America, Microsoft. And I said, no, I don't think we need to do a shot. He said, we got this. I got this. You got this. We're good. I care about you. You care about your team. It was just model coach care, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. Right. Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, probably some of our listeners out there are probably going to be, as they're listening, like, why in the world are they talking to a corporate level guy on a sports podcast? And, you know, I think one of the things that Justin, I've been talking about because is technology I'm actually, is taking over sports, actually. Well, that, that's but, yeah. absolutely true. But <laughs> I, I've been, I've been actually really excited about this for the last couple of months as we started talking to you about getting you on a date here to, to be on the show, Jeff, because there's so many uh, cross, uh, examples of what you do in sports in terms of developing a team, developing leaders, having that mindset of modeling it and being a servant leader in the middle of it all. And I know on the corporate side that that has to be the case because, um, it, it just, there's, there's just like in sports, there's good teams and bad teams. And I know in the business world, there's great businesses and bad businesses. And mm -hmm. I think you've exp experienced, whether it was at Microsoft or Twitter or now at Automatic, that every step along the way in your career, you have seen servant-based leadership be something that's very successful and modeled on a, on a continual basis. So I want to ask you another question that brings over that sort of that sport analogy. Like we talk all the time about uh, a student athlete that we work with or just a junior hockey player going to pro, that there's very little difference between going from, say, junior to getting drafted to playing pro and then being successful in pro and and the ditches of hockey or sport at the elite level are filled with athletes who aren't committed to pursue that excellence on a daily basis. And so there's very little that separates good to bad or yeah. good to great. In the corporate world, um, you know, you just said Microsoft had whatever, 150,000 employees. I'm not sure at Automatic what you know your employee count is, but what have you seen in your leadership level that separates like just a good employee to a great employee. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I, I've been in different sized environments. Twitter was like, I think got to about 4,000 employees when I was there. Microsoft, yeah, it's like 150,000 people. When I started there, I had a team of about 80 people. Um, as I finished, there's about 5,000 people that worked for me there. I was like, my hometown's like 10,000 people. 
Yeah. <laughs> like, 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 wow. There's like more parking spaces in Microsoft's parking garages than there are cars in my hometown. Um, automatic, um, about 2,000 people, um, 100% remote, automatic, builds things like WordPress dot com, Tumblr dot com, um, WooCommerce, but um, two thousand employees, at eighty countries. Mm. Um, you know, um, trying to think. You know, what it, kind of take me back to the question there a little bit, like yeah, of, just the the level of like even for? maybe maybe it's not even your employees, but what what is it that really separates a a, a good leader then to a great leader? Yeah, I'm a good employee or a great employee, both both of them I can answer what do I look for in talent? Yeah. Right. Or what is that talent going to be? You know, it's a lot of those things of, of like, of just being a good human. Right. Mm -hmm. What are those values that you can see that come through in an employee? Right. Um, conscientiousness, right. Um, being honest, kind of that golden rule. Hey, they're, they're good to others. Curiosity. Mm -hmm. Those are an employee, right. They're always curious. They're always learning. Right. And I will give my bet will be on technology, but I think every company now is a technology company in one shape or way, right? But how are they learning? What are they learning? What do they learn from their mistakes? Are they able to take risks? You know, they talk too much. Hmm. They listen, right? You listen to it. I talk too much sometimes, right? I love to tell stories, but like, hey, or do they listen? Um, are they willing to try things? Innovation, right? That's, I almost don't like that word, but like, is there a creativity? I I will look for creativity. Um, when I think about you know in in technology, the employee, you know, like in that journey, you line it up next to a hockey player. Sometimes similar type of path. Somebody makes the NHL. In fact, I remember when I went to Microsoft, uh, home papers like I, hey, it's looked like he's gone to the NHL of the computer world. I went in ninety seven. And uh, so a lot of analogies, but you know, you have people that grow up, they're coding at a young age. All they want to do in their hours is code. No different than all they want to do is skate. All they want to do is practice. All they want to do is have pickup games in front of their house. Game on, right? Yeah. All they can talk about is watching the games and consuming them. Hey, the computer people, all they can think about is technology and how can they use it who can they talk to and how can they connect to and how can they learn more right and they start building something they start having these little wins and wow they're really great at this wow they're a natural wow i can't believe how much you see just the potential of them compared to others i mean in hockey you can always have that person on their team on the team is like okay can one of us score a goal as well like we really like winning <laughs> but <laughs> you knew the person that differentiated and stood out and, and and often they were like nice person too right good person to connect to everybody loved them on the team they were a leader right you saw people in, in technology they do that they become leaders in user groups and leaders in online forums and teaching and coaching and they're curious and constantly learning right hey they get some gigs right like hockey players you know you get off there but hey you get some work i remember when i was like 16 i got local things to go program stuff in around my small town in esteban and i was like doing this while going to school and you know wow you know you, you start seeing that success someday somebody notices you right mm -hmm. and this happens all through your career people notice you right hockey you have people on the stands watching to see hey this is a new future player for a farm team. We do the same thing. Mm -hmm. We go out and we look at people and young talent. I see people on social media and they're honestly like they're an intern or they're in college and you're paying attention to them across their social channels and you're watching them on LinkedIn, not in a spooky way. It's like literally them posting about their videos or their, their work that they're doing, their craft. And you go, wow, this person's really interesting. Um, as they, you know, you get through that someday, a company reaches out. We really like you. We mm -hmm. want you to start here. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like getting drafted. Yeah. yeah. You know, I was in Estevan. I was working at a mobile home company doing computers there for sort of part time. I was doing drafting because you couldn't support a computer job full time. <laughs> I was 
programming on the side. I was looking after local accounting businesses, like their networks, because I knew how to go do that. And I was building websites as well. And this is like 96. And I was answering more questions in the Microsoft forums on certain programming than a lot of the employees. And I got a call. I was like, hey, have you thought about working here? And I actually hung up on them because I thought it was a friend of mine playing a trick on me. <laughs> and I said, stop it. I ended up going there. And that's when the learning started. That's when you learn how much you don't know. Mm -hmm. Right? Right? Like, you know, here locally, I watched the new players. Kraken has really local Seattle here. NHL has really invested in youth hockey as one of the biggest farm team networks because they realized like they had to build from the ground up. You watch those players um, come online and begin um, learning about the team and the system, right? I, what I've heard is like a lot of, well, we're learning the system of the crack and I didn't have any visibility to that. Guess what? Every company has a system. They have a rhythm. They have a way of doing it. They have cultural norms that you're going to have to learn into. And that's just like joining a new team. Um, I think those are some of the analogies of that journey that we, uh, um, yeah. you know, that we go on and you're whatever, wherever you're on your career stage, right. Early in your career, later in your career, um, people are constantly watching you, whatever the thing is. And Hey, they're really good at what they do. Yeah. Yeah. Enjoying that process. Um, you know, making the right decisions at the right time and just daily sounds like being a good person and, and, um, you know, getting better at your craft every single day and you're, you're going to get noticed eventually. Right. And it's, uh, what differentiates you though? Yeah. What differentiates you is going to be the thing, right? What's your superpower? Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like what's your superpower? If you're a hockey player, Hey, you're this person that, you know, plays a certain role in the team. What makes you unique? You know, what are you, the, what problem are you the solution to? Yeah. I think too, the, one of the things that I find really intriguing and as you sort of shared a bit about your journey going from, you know, working in Estevan and doing some of those projects to, you know, being a, a VP of a fortune 500, I'm sure somewhere along that way, you probably sat back and you're like, I can't believe that I can actually be doing this. Right. Because there's so many kids from small towns in sports. Let's use hockey because that's our, our bread and butter here. They come from a small town and they're like, well, I, you know, I, I'm not going to get drafted because that's for the kid from the city or that's for a kid that's got, excuse me, way more opportunities. And so they just sort of, you know, they, they work hard and they kind of putz along and they do the right things. They're trying to be a leader. But at some point, and I think it's, you know, at, at our academy where we see them sort of go from that U15 gr age group to maybe into the U18s where they gain that confidence and all of a sudden they're like, oh, this, this could be a possibility. Like that, I might have a chance to actually go and play junior or a chance to go and play pro, right? There's that moment where um, they 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 realize that wow I've got I've got something going here. In your career, at what point did that happen for you? Like, was it when you were working, <laughs> you know, at, at the mobile home park there and, and coding and doing some stuff for them, or was it somewhere else along the way that you said actually, I like I I can actually be a difference maker in the corporate world. Well. Yeah, great question. I, I'd say first, I'll just say every step along the way, I've I have imposter syndrome and things of like that. I don't need to. I should not be here. Why am I here, etc. Right. But to kind of you know take things back about well, going along that journey. My journey was not ever in any part of it. Did I ever think I was going to be successful? It was just literally. I was like. Um, my fiance at the time, we were living in Estevan and she's from the States. And I said, Hey, I'm interviewing at Microsoft. I was like, what a privilege. She says, what's the next step? And I said, I did an initial call and they said, the next step is a technical phone screen. And you know what? I get that. What a cool thing to tell people. Microsoft <laughs> called me in Estevan to go do this. Did the technical phone screen. She said, what's next? They want me to do another call with another person on the team. So I'm going to do that tomorrow. Okay. What's the next step? I'm like, you know, I didn't know all the way. I was just like, yeah, I get one more call. That's great. <laughs> she said, what's the next step? They're going to fly me to Redmond, Seattle, just outside of Seattle to do on-site interviews for three different jobs at that time. And 
What a privilege. Can you believe that Microsoft's flying me? I've never been to Seattle before. She said, <laughs> do they pay for your hotel? And I was like, you know, like, yeah, I got a rental car. Um, it's like all, you have to reimburse. No, it's just all booked for me. There's a nice packet. Like, wow. You know, if I just get a trip to Seattle. What a privilege. Wow, how great would that be? Yeah. yeah. Next thing. They want to offer me a job. Secretly, my wife was already packing <laughs> before we even had the first one because she said there was just no doubt it was going to happen. Hmm. I was constantly, it was just that next step. But I will tell you a secret that I actually can tell when, when I can actually really feel I'm going to be successful about something. It's when I can picture the story. Hmm. And no it's okay to dream a little bit. Okay. It's really hard sometimes in a small town, you're in Estevan or wherever it is. Like it's sometimes hard to dream, mm -hmm. you know, maybe you don't have all the same opportunities. Heck, you know, we had to drive an hour to go to McDonald's just to get good <laughs> French fries. Right. <laughs> it's sometimes hard to dream, but you know, secretly while I was, just trying to be, hey, get me to the next step. I could, wow, what if I got there? Mm -hmm. What if I got there? If I get there, I can do this. And when I got there, I saw other things that I could go do. And I was like, I was, I literally started in a cube answering the phone, doing support, helping support our projects. I didn't go from Estevan to corporate VP. I was literally, Microsoft, how can I help you? I was right. answering a one eight great freaking paying job. It probably paid like five times anything I'd make in Esteban. And I got to learn our products and I got to learn our customers. And I got to talk to pro customers that had problems and and help. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I started seeing other roles because I small company, Microsoft then had like 17,000 people. Right. It's still a huge number, right? And you got to go see this dream. And I was like, wait, could I end up in a product team? Nah, you know, people on my team were like, nah, you know, it really ever happens here. You know, you're, you're in support. It's not going to happen. You know, nah, you, you know, you've got a SAIT degree. You know, it's like a drafting <laughs> design diploma, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Other people, yes, it's Microsoft can do anything here. Uh -oh. Our founder dropped out of college. Who told you about your SAIT diploma? <laughs> Tell them to get that. Yeah. Wow, you're really good with our customers and you solve a lot of problems for that are technical for them. Wow, could I end up in a product team? I did make that move. Could I ship product? Right? Could I do these other things? And I could picture this narrative and I had this story. And all of a sudden, I think one day it was like that story wasn't happening because certain things weren't happening good for the company. So I pictured another one, which was go to Twitter, but I had that narrative. When mm. I came back, I'll tell you, when I came back to, to come back to work at Microsoft, I could picture the story. I could picture it and go, I could do this, lean into that for a couple of years. That allow me to grow, to be a product leader and earn respect. And if you can picture that narrative, and I would say, go back to being in a small town, it's hard to dream. Mm. People, friends might tease you, who are you? to say that you can make the NHL. Who are you to tell me that I'm not going to? Mm -hmm. You're telling yourself more that you can't do it inside your head every day. And that never gets easier. Mm -hmm. Never gets easier. Um, if you can go sit back and dream and you can kind of picture those steps. Hey, I want to get on this level of a team this year. I want to be able to score this many goals. And boy, I really think that this year is where I show up a certain way. And I'm going to really go after that team to go on to that. You know, those are some of the ways. But think about your story. Dream a little bit. Write it down. Mm -hmm. Journal it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, I think that, you know, for our listeners out there, I think it's one of those things where what I'm hearing you say is that there was no shortcut. Like you said, when they, when you went through that interview process, you had to start in the trenches and you had to just keep being pursuing excellence, but have that dream. And there's so many times where I think our kids, um, and, and young athletes today, they just, they're looking for the quickest shortcut. How, how can I get and not have to go through some adversity and all this other stuff. And then, 
you know, in the midst of it, their dream dies because maybe it's their parents' dream or it's not their dream. And so I love that analogy that you've given us or that story that you're, you're, you're telling us about how you, you appreciated every opportunity. You took advantage of every opportunity because you kept having a goal set before you. And, um, as we tie that back to, you know, some of the, the players that you get to watch, play for the crack. And I, there's two guys in particular, Jordan Eberle, who just played his thousandth game. Um, he's a Regina kid. You know, he put up like 200 Love and some him. points in Regina as minor hockey. He was an eighth round draft pick by the Regina Pats. Like there was just so many things in his story that there was no easy road for him, but he just kept pursuing excellence. And then the other one is more relatable for me is because I had the chance to coach Jaden Schwartz at Notre Dame. And he was a 16 year old yep. phenom in the junior ranks. And at any point, if we just needed a goal, it'd be like, Schwartzy, like, let's get her going here. And and he would come in and he'd just be like, I've, I've got more. I've got more. You know, give me another shift. I got more. And yep. and it was just one of those things as a 16-year-old kid from Wilcox, Saskatchewan, the smallest hockey town in the province, it was this kid that maybe he got opportunities to be on the ice every day, but he had a hunger and a drive in him that's now propelled him to a Stanley Cup championship. And now he's one of the leaders with you guys. And... uh Talk to us about what the Kraken have done in the Seattle area. We've heard these crazy numbers that there's rinks being built everywhere. There's 40,000 new students playing minor hockey. What's you, You've been there without hockey. Oh, my god! And now you're in the yeah. middle of, like, the biggest growth ever. How is that, how is that going for you? Yeah, it's crazy. Like, I'm um, just getting some notes, I think, that I took here before the call around the Kraken. You know, I grew up Estevan watching hockey there was no winnipeg team back then calgary edmonton were like um maybe we're gonna go to a game my first game was edmonton my uncle rod had season tickets down the lower in the bowl and we had some family things we had a whole bunch up in the nosebleeds i get emotional about it because my uncle mine passed away last year but like that first game experience it was just really really something so why i get emotional about hockey tickets was like i never imagined i'd be able to afford season tickets Hmm. and how the leadership team here in seattle went about it and how the community came into it i remember we didn't have a team yet they were just checking interest and we had to get ten thousand people to either sign up and give a deposit of $500 or $1,000 for the game. We reached the 10,000 in 12 minutes. (laughs) We gave 33,000 within the hour. Got up the the morning of all of my work buddies. We were in work super early. We had computers lined up in a conference room, a laptop. (laughs) tabs open people that i knew had their receptionist all waiting for the time to submit to give your your 500 if you wanted a certain level of seat or a thousand if you wanted club level and um i knew back home there were backup people you name it um and we sit there and we go submit and i got my number back and you didn't know what was going on because you didn't know that Great, a sign up in the history of the NHL right. deposits like was happening. And I got a number. Years went by, right? Time went by, arena announcements. They took the classic key arena that's by the C- Seattle Space Needle and literally lift the classic roof of it up and built an entire new arena underneath it from the ground up. And it was during COVID. Um, we got uh, a note that said, it's time to pick your seats. And we didn't go to the new arena. You went to a separate place off of it. They gave me a hockey stick. My wife went with me and they brought up on a computer screen where you can pick your seats. And she just said, well, your number is great. You're going to have these just really great seats. And we ended up picking it. And I'm just like, we're going to spend this on hockey Season tickets, we got club level, we got two for us. She said, we're doing this. 
So now more time goes by. In fact, they had to delay the opening. They did a really cool thing. Rather than they couldn't have the opening of a few games of the preseason, they went to local rinks down the league. They went to Spokane. They, you know, Calgary Flames were one of the opening teams. And so Spokane got a Calgary cracking game. I'm emotional about this because the night we showed up, sorry, the night we came to that first game, Alan May, um, good friend of mine, yeah. Washington Capitals player called me and he goes, dude, once in a lifetime experience for you that you're going to go to here. Yeah. Have fun. My wife and I go to the game, get to our tickets, go and sit down. Oh my God, guys. I thought our tickets were like all the way over more to the right. We're on some freaking blue line. <laughs> you looked around and you saw the people sitting next to you. It was like a Canadian reunion, man. So cool. All the people around you. And it was like going home. It was like going home. Man. Yeah. You know, I um, talk about a lot of things. I get a lot of credit for like moving away from hometown, leaving Saskatchewan. People don't talk about it that way. I got to go back. Hmm. And so when I go into a game, bring a friend, you know, I've, you know, felt like I was part of something. And, and it just, it was so special. They, um, they, you can go find it on YouTube. I'll send you guys a link to it and find it over. Like when they talked about this at the first game, they're like, we broke all sorts of records because of, you know, you always hear it. Hey, yeah. you're this fan, you're, you know, that, but like, you know, it was like 32. That's why they have to retire the Jersey 32. And so that's just a start. But what has hockey done? Mm. What have they done? That's first at the fans. More interesting thing is if you're going to go build a team from scratch, you got to build a farm league, right? That's why the Kraken have down in Coachella Valley. Yeah. They've got, Great farm team league down there. They've got down in Texas. I think they're out in, out in the Carolinas. Here locally. You know, there's hockey. There's beer leagues. You know, what you'd expect. Really hard to get ice time. But they built a world-class training facility with, I think, so like three or four ice surfaces. And it's community. It's not just the crack and, and just phenomenal growth in youth hockey. I think the branding of the Kraken is just spot on. Um, people love that. It was perfect timing for the city. Um, we don't have a bat pro basketball team. And it just, you know, Seattle is a, is a, is, a, is a, you know, is a hockey town now. They've announced they're, you know, I don't think for sure that it's going to happen, but they've announced that they want to do and establish more ice services. So like, I live on a small little farm outside of Seattle and near me, they're, they're looking at adding four more surfaces and it's just for youth hockey. And that's the crack I'm doing that. But uh, players like Everly and so forth, like Jordan Everly, that's my player. I got <laughs> his jerseys. I've got, I've got the player that he, or the Jersey that he wrote war um, in the game three of the preseason, the first season. Awesome. And I wear it to every game. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. And, okay, and, I can get through the tears. Holy shit! Whoever climate said pledge you, arena. You can it, even cry about going to a hockey game, man. But. <laughs> That's okay. You're talking to yeah. a um, well, two guys that have probably done the same thing, and um, and I'm sure a whole group of listeners uh, that 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 feel that, and especially that. I mean, I felt it when you just said it was like you know you got to go home again, right? And so much, you know, so many of us and listeners here grew grew up in the prairies and in small towns and had these experiences and. Um, Man, they make an impact on us for life. Yeah. And uh, my favorite thing in the world to do today, and I tell my wife this often, is still just to go to arenas. I don't mm -hmm. care if it's a Saskatchewan Rough Rider game or if it's a, you know, a S Seattle Kraken or, you know, I've been to some Seattle Mariner games and like just walking to that arena, uh, yeah. the entertainment, the feeling, the sense you get. I got to go to Wrigley Field this past summer for the first time in my life. Oh, and, boy. Wow. And just what? I, I don't know. I felt like I was dragging my wife along and I think she was talking to me. I wasn't even paying attention because I'm just like walking up to the stadium and it's just this, this feeling and this sense. And when you come up those stairs for the first time and look over that field and the Ivy and it just like, it takes your breath away. Right. Um, yeah. and I can't imagine that sense of that, you know, no one had sat in those seats before 
Jeff, right? These, no. these season seats of yours. <laughs> yeah. yeah, nobody had. Yeah, incredible. So no, I, we, we sit in the seats and, and you could tell like, you know, of the the couples or the families are sitting down, who was the real, like first not real, but like who was the mate more of a fan? And I'd say not like my wife now equal fan as we are, like um like totally. Um, but I was sitting there going, are these my seats? Am I in the right seat? Because like the, the picture and what happened, there was just this interesting thing is when they got into actual execution, Kraken, when they built the stadium, they could have, I figured, which was the recent stadium in Canada, most recent built, but it was really maximized on seating. Kraken didn't maximize on seating. They did maximize on just certain things in the design on it where you don't have to go up if you have, there's no nosebleeds. Like there's nosebleeds, but you don't go up like this escalator and then that escalator yeah. and this one here. It's hardly you're... above sea level. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. really, really nice, right? Like I can go to my seats. I timed it with a friend. I was actually talking to a friend back home in Estevan. He says, what are you doing? I said, I'm walking into the game. Well, you got to go. You're going to have to do this. I said, no, I'll just do this. I walk in, swipe my iPhone, literally walk down there. And he goes, where are you now? And I said, I'm sitting in my seats. It takes me like two and a half minutes to get yeah, from yeah. door to entry. But yeah, the just that moment hearing for the very first time them you know the, the songs that they'd play for when they score a goal and you've been to a cracking game like it's just incredible yeah. yeah yeah and what i mean your your first experience of that that game there um feels like you're telling us like it was almost like a religious experience for you and growing up yep. in estevan at the old civic auditorium um i was a i was a stick boy when alan was playing and you remember that time when, when they won the championship against Weyburn. And I'll never forget, like, Les Godfrey, whose son Steve was playing <laughs> yeah. on the team, was in the middle of the lobby cheering because the lobby was absolutely packed. Like, the, we won in Game 7 in Weyburn, and, and it was bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic all the way back to Esteban. We all went back to the Civic Auditorium. And in that lobby, you, you couldn't move. And, and there was Les standing above the crowd, just getting everyone wound up. And for me, that was like, all, I'm, the Civic Auditorium, unfortunately, is torn down now. But in my head, I can walk through these doors right now and see that same experience because yeah. the the seats were filled, the stairways were jam-packed with kids, and everyone was hanging off the glass. And and as, I'm sure everyone has those type of, of opportunities to, whether it's in a small town like Craig, who still to this day doesn't even have glass on the sides and fans hang over during senior hockey games, or whether you get the chance to be at a, a Seattle Kraken moment, it's these these opportunities to to be and experience um, uh, sporting events. I think is is something special that we all cling to. And again, I, I I like it back to that point where we all dream of these opportunities, right? It's like, well, you know, like you know, if you think of Jordan Eberle, I'm sure at some point he probably thought, well, I'll, I'll never be playing professional hockey. I'll never score a goal at the World Juniors. I'll never, right? But Every day, step by step, pursuing excellence, being a great leader, being a great teammate. That's why he gets to play a thousand games today because he kept dreaming and kept putting the dream in front of him. And so, thanks for sharing that story with us. I think that that's you know brings us all back to some of those moments. And um, you know, I, I think that as we as we kind of talk a little bit more about just some of those things that are happening in, in the Seattle area, do you see that growth? Like those, there had to be other kids that obviously there in at that game and continue to come to those games. When they're going out into those new arenas and playing and whatnot, do you see a, a like, is there a good groundswell? Like, what continue? Or is this just going to be a blip on the map and all of a sudden in four years, like Atlanta, you're going to be moved to Houston or something like that? Yeah. Do you mean, like, I would say, I don't think this is just a moment, right? Because we're, I don't know what year we're on now, three or so. And, you know, this hasn't been our season. Last season, we made it to freaking playoffs. Like, wow. Right. But in the youth side of it, yeah. I mean, I, here's my anecdotal. Facebook. I have friends on Facebook that have kids. I've got watched this one friend of mine. His son played hockey. He's They're from, actually, I think they're from around Winnipeg. Fellow Canadian, but he, I've worked with him at Microsoft. And I think he's at Amazon now. I watched his son through Facebook. He was playing. And then he got into refereeing mm -hmm. and he was refereeing youth games and he was refereeing this. And then uh, I think a couple of Kraken games ago, 
he refed they bring in youth game teams locally to play in between the periods um and he was refereeing there and he's all parts of all sorts of clinics about refereeing that are held at the Kraken training facilities. And then you watch the the teams growing up that are playing at intermission. But beyond that, I just see on Facebook so many boys and girls playing hockey um, and, and interested in it. Uh, I, I think it is once you get started, maybe you do stop and you learn from it. But then you know, once you get started, how do you stop? Right. Mm-hmm. And so... I think that they're doing it the right way. I think Kraken, even if you look at their roster, I think oh, they're really looking at draft picks, their investment in the farm teams. Like that's a really, this is their Seattle team, the leadership team. Um, it's, you know, Andy Jassy is the CEO of Amazon, is a shareholder in the team owner. owner. His basement apparently his house has a sports bar. Um, <laughs> he, he And literally he is a, unbelievable hockey team it is called the climate pledge arena because they didn't want to call it the amazon arena they had the naming rights to it um you know the amount of money that's behind that team right you know i think they're going to build a championship team a lot of people disagree i got a lot of arguments with alan (laughs) may on their original picks and he's like what a nightmare you're gonna have really a great time at the event but your team sucks Uh, (laughs) oh your team sucks and they're picked Picks were, and then somebody told me, no, they're looking at the long term. And I heard all these theories from the goalie out. Back to Jordan Everly. You should see if Jordan just was always it's about reinvention too, right? And reinventing yourself. And 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 we talked about differentiation earlier, right? Jordan Everly, it sounded like he almost wasn't getting signed again this year. OK, like it was like really close down to the wire. And we read all the probably the same rumor mill thing. So if it's true or not. But here's why I heard Jordan Everly got renewed at the end. Okay, he wanted a three or a four year contract. He got a certain one. They're going to get rid of him because we figured we weren't going to make the playoffs. And then all of a sudden there got to be a chance that, holy heck, they have a slim chance. And don't think it's going to work out for us. But who did they need more than anything at that point in time? Jordan Everly. Right. They needed him if they're going to go into playoffs. So then they, he got closer to that. I heard, I heard he just really loves Seattle. Like just, you know, and it's also close to Canada and yeah. so forth. But what differentiates himself? I guarantee it. What he learns, what he does is so different now than when he was in Ed, Edmonton or mm-hmm. where he was, you know, Cal or in Regina at the Pats too, right? Because now he's the leader of the team. Right. Right. And that's something I didn't understand about hockey. Man, I didn't understand at the NHL level until I started watching the team. Or maybe this is just how much the coaches talk about those captains of the players as leaders of the team, mm-hmm. right? When those new players, new drafts are coming into the group, it's like, who are those leaders? Who are those mentors? Who are the ones that are looking at them wholeheartedly? And those are stories like when I talked to Alan May, he talks about his time in the Dallas Stars and how do you get make sure people keep their stick on the ice, so to speak? And you get a lot of distractions around you when you start doing certain, you know, you're getting success, right? And yeah. hey, how do you keep your head on, you know, yeah. head on your shoulders, so to speak, right? And and so on. But yeah, Everly love him. Yeah. And uh my wife's a Tana fan. Okay. Which is like, like yeah. That, yeah, she's like, she's got Tana's jersey. Yeah. Like you like the goons and like yeah yeah I like that yeah oh <laughs> uh, yeah he's a great great player as well so yeah I think uh, what I've appreciated about the conversation today and just tying it even back to you know the podcast and our purpose of what we're doing is you know you can be a top five percent hockey player in the world and not make the national league right it's yeah. um, the top one percenters make the national league and um, but at the end of the day you know our purpose at Prairie Hockey Academy is to use the power of hockey to develop life champions. And just this idea that you mm-hmm. spoke about throughout today's podcast of, of just, you know, that dream, uh, having a goal, having a dream, being able to see it, being able to work towards it, uh, keep putting in the work, you know, you might be serving at this spot. It's a privilege, you know, don't, don't listen to a naysayer that says you can't, you can't be on a product development team. You're just a support person. It's just, you know, actually just do the best you can while you're here, um, serve really well answer people's questions they're going to notice right and and keep getting better every day and so i think um you know i know that someday at automatic perhaps you'll have the opportunity to uh to hire 
you know, somebody with some talent, uh, but but hopefully some incredible character and leadership skills that perhaps they learned at Prairie Hockey Academy. Um, we might have an athlete or two that play in the NHL, and that'll be fantastic. Um, but we'll have a lot of top five and ten percenters that that maybe just need or um, are, are get an opportunity to serve at an incredible organization and um, and make an impact. Um, hockey might end at thirty four also if they make the NHL. So it's <laughs> it's uh, yeah. it's it's what we're about and. And I think today's episode was really awesome just to see, you know, how these leadership skills, and I think you started there right at the start, you know, leaders bring clarity. Uh, and I think that, that made a lot of sense, even for us as, as coaches and staff of how do we lead young men? Um, you know, we got to bring clarity to them uh, and young ladies in the game of sport even. Uh, what's their role? What's the responsibility? What do they need to get better at today? Uh, those pieces help them drive success and help them know what they want to do today to, to serve their teammates, right? So... It's all really tied in together. I think it was great, and and uh, mm-hmm. yeah, good luck with the Kraken. Yeah. I'd uh, definitely have hired people from hockey. Yeah. Sometimes finding out after the fact, sometimes finding out through a real fun story. It was a fellow that worked for me for a number of years. He actually later on in his career for a few years bought the Calgary Canucks. Named no, to- Arthur Yuzinski, and he bought that team. It's different ownership now, but he's part of that ownership group while he worked for me at Microsoft. But hey, I really appreciate the time on here yeah. and and getting connect with you all too. So, you know, there ain't nothing like a small town rank and a rank burger. Right. I would say that's the only thing as we talk about these great facilities, but there ain't anything compared to a small town rank and a rank burger. <laughs> it's been great, Jeff. I think I would, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you one quick question before we wrap up. Um, and that has to do around all the tech uh, side of things in terms of AI and, yeah. uh, and even things, you know, last week I sat down with my, my U15 team and, and gave them a Bitcoin lesson <laughs> or mm-hmm. no, sorry, not Bitcoin on, on blockchain, um, that led into some Bitcoin discussion, but from your side of it, just quickly, um, on the AI side of things and, and as our student athletes, they're, they're student athletes first, they're students, then they get to be mm-hmm. athletes. Is AI going to continue to change their world? And is that something they need to continue to lean in on? So it will change all of our worlds. Mm -hmm. Um, I think there's a famous quote, which we overestimate what what will change in three years. And we underestimate what will change over 10. Very simply, the technology that we're hearing about right now is a thing called large language models. At the most simplest level, it's no different than autocomplete, right? You're typing in a word and it gives you the suggestion. Right. Very smart people said, hey, could we write math problems to help predict? If I'm typing the quick brown fox, it probably completes jump over the lazy dog. But could we take it, if you ask it a question, by being trained on all of the internet, maybe, you know, could it do things? What could it give you the answer to those questions? And so at the most simpler things, it's this thing called text expanders and at these large language models. And you can use chat, GPT, you can go there and ask it a question. You can help it give you an outline. Um, there's other products, Copilot from Microsoft, and there's others. But I would never turn down a spell check in the past. I would never turn down an autocomplete. Don't turn down a Copilot or an AI assist because for a number of different things right now, it will help you differentiate. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you examples. You know, it's sometimes not always accurate for certain things of math and so forth, but if you want to learn something, ask it a question, it's so much better than search and Google to go through that because it'll give you the answer. You're stuck. You have to write a paper. You're unsure of an outline. Don't have it write the whole paper for you. People are going to be able to tell in a heartbeat. But hey, what's an outline on this topic, right? And you can annotate those sources and stuff like that. But I would say 100%, you need to leverage this as an assist in your toolkit. So if I'm learning a new job or I'm learning how to go a new task or I'm not sure what somebody's saying in a meeting or honestly, you know, I had to look up what something met that a younger person in our team was saying about, you know, kind of like Urban Dictionary. I'll use it for that. I'll use it to help me write code. Yep. I don't write much code anymore, but if I want to hack something together, it'll help me do that. It's an AI assist. 
And there is a lot of work that needs to be done. There's a lot of crazy things being said. And there's a lot of true things being said about it. But at, at its simplest level, it's a, it's a co-pilot for you and an assistant. And I would encourage, you know, people to use it to answer their questions. Um, you know, different domain experts, you validate it to make sure it's true. But, you know, technology... Every company now is a technology. Every hockey team is a technology thing. You know, there's people that were doing scouting, but now there's statistical analytics, technology. Amazon's one of the biggest sponsors of the Kraken because of technology and work, right? right? And so they'll be using AI to predict rosters and teams and and so forth. But at its simplest level, it's a great assist. You know, I use it to sometimes if there's certain business-related mails that I've got to do that are more not customer, but like process. I'll help them help me write them. Um, and I think we're in a really interesting time. This is as fundamental, if not larger, of a change in technology that is starting right now. It's called a platform shift. And yeah. so there have been different platform shifts over time. There was large mainframe computers, then we came into personal computers. Then there was a time when we went from like kind of DOS-based things to Windows where you point and click. Uh, then the internet happened, right? A shift to internet-based apps. Then the mobile transition happened from of the iPhones and Android and apps. That was probably one of the last single largest large language models. And and what's happening with AI right now around building these co-pilots and, and, and assists is this fundamental change of the mainframe to PC or the, the phone and iPhone apps and what's happening there. And so pay attention to it. Technology is a great career. It pays well. It's still hiring. I had somebody reach out to me. My kids go into tech. Hear about a lot of tech layoffs, and I was like, "Do they love it? Yes, they do. Then they they should." Yeah, and that's a, a great way, I think, to wrap up. We've talked a lot about business and sport and how we need to continue embracing challenges and and pursue excellence through that. Be a great leader, and the same thing when it comes to tech. Um, don't be afraid of it. We. We, uh, we uh, at least our staff, we try to drip it onto our student athletes at Prairie Hockey Academy all the time, and and challenge them to to dig into Chat GPT, not as a cheat code, not as a way to shortcut things, but as a way to learn. It's a it's a process for you to learn more quicker, and uh, I think it's just a, a great thing that we can continue to develop, and um, it's going to change sports. It's continue to change our lives, and uh, and we need to embrace it. And so, yeah, we will continue to. To work our way through that. And uh, again, Jeff, really thankful that you've taken the time out to be with us today um, to hear your passionate stories um, about hockey and how you have journeyed from small town Estevan, Saskatchewan, and uh, continued to be a pioneer all the way through, didn't take any shortcuts. And, uh, and here you are, just continuing to be a leader, um, not just in the tech industry, but a leader wherever you're at. And so I'm thankful that you've joined us. And uh, really cool to see that motorbike sitting behind you in, in uh, your house and all the stories that, uh, that I'm sure wrap around that. But thanks for spending time with us today. And we look forward to uh, hearing your continued journey with Automatic and, and what you continue to do. Awesome. Thank you. Great to be here. Appreciate all that you guys do for hockey. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Good luck with cracking the back <laughs> half here. And to our Don't listeners crack. out there, thank you for joining us on the Win All Day Everyday Podcast. We are excited to continue to journey, whether it's people that we bring in as guests like Jeff today or as other players that we've had in the past and other people, leaders in their industries. We're thankful that you continue to join us podcast after podcast. So we we want you to hit that like button, make sure you share our episodes with other people because we want to continue to grow it as we continue to help you navigate the high performance sport world. And uh, we're just here along with you in the journey and we thank you for the opportunity to uh, sit with us today and listen along and uh, we look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Win All Day Every Day podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, we would ask that you leave us a five-star review and consider subscribing.